Well, thanks to everyone. My name is Sandy Connolly. I'm the Communications Director at the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our public engagement call about applying to college during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we all know, this has been an unprecedented year in so many aspects of life, and that extends to college admissions. On today's call, we will be joined by content experts, high school counselors, and admissions directors to discuss exactly how the college admissions process has changed and what students and families can expect this year, especially for Black, Indigenous, people of color, or BIPOC communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to our MC and outreach coordinator, Kat Klima. Take good care, everyone, and thanks for joining. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Sandy. So again, I want to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has taken the time out of their day to join us on this public engagement call. So I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of these public engagement calls. And in order to do that, I need to tell you a little bit about our agency. So we are the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. We're a state agency dedicated to the support of students in attaining a post-secondary credential. And within the context of these public engagement calls, we strive to engage with diverse communities to identify barriers in post-secondary education. We strive to work in collaboration with communities to provide equitable access to information and advice that leads to the pursuit of post-secondary education and or training in Minnesota. And so to give you um, some background about these calls specifically, they were born out of in a need to increase communication in the wake of COVID-19. However, we do plan to, to continue these calls after the global pandemic has subsided. We are always seeking new and innovative ways to collaborate with the communities of Minnesota, and we welcome your feedback and your questions. In terms of how you can communicate with us, we will have the chat box open if it isn't already, um, and we will encourage you to ask questions to our amazing panelists today at the end of the panel. So please do hold your questions until the end. Um, and so today's topic is applying to college during COVID-19. So we're gonna be discussing with this panel about changes in the application and admissions process, college access programs, the benefits and disadvantages of a gap year, and the future of college as we know it. Our focus in these calls is discussing how all of these things impact students and specifically black, indigenous, and people of color communities. And so this is an acronym that we are going to be using and it's called BIPOC. So again, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. And so I'm going to introduce uh, the, the uh, panel, and, uh, and then what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some data, right, that's going to set the stage for this conversation about, educa about education and college access. Um, but I do want to make sure that, that we know who's on the call first. Uh, so Brian Jones, can you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm Brian Jones. I'm the Director of Admissions uh, down here at Minnesota State University in Mankato, and I've been in this role for about 11 years. All right, thank you. And Derek Francis, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Derek Francis. I am um, the manager of uh, Minneapolis Public Schools uh, School Counseling Department, and uh, I enjoy our team, so that's who I am. Thank you. And then we've got Miguel Ovies Bocanegra. Hi, everybody. Um, Miguel Ovias Boca Negra, he, him, his. Um, and I work at the Office of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I'm one of the assistant directors, but specifically focusing on multicultural recruitment. Thank you. We've also got Patrick Milton on the line. Patrick, can you hear something? There we go. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, again, Patrick Milton. I'm the director for Get Ready, Gear Up here at the Office of Higher Education. All right, thank you. And last but not least, we've got Samina Ali. Hi, everyone. My name is Samina Ali. I'm a school counselor at Johnson Senior High School, St. Paul Public School. So I also help with the College and Career Center. Great, thank you so much. 
All right, and then panelists, if you could please mute your mics uh, just until uh, we dive back into the panel discussion. And so thank you for that. And so again, like I was saying, I do want to talk briefly about the data just so we can set the stage for this discussion on, on college attainment. So I'm going to share my screen. So we're going to do screen one, which is going to show you Cisco. Yep. Um, and we're going to start off here. Can everybody can everybody see? And I know that there are people who are calling in right now, uh, so I will be sure to include this both in the email that goes out afterwards that includes the the recording, um, but also um, I'll put this in the chat box so that people people can see it. So I, I want to talk about what's called educational attainment. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, educational attainment is this idea of, of who has some type of post-secondary credential. They have attained some, like some type of degree, and that could be um, a short-term certificate program. It could be a two-year degree. It could be a four-year, all the way up to a PhD. So when we're talking about educational attainment, that's what that means. And in the state of Minnesota, we do have the 2025 educational attainment goal. And what that is, is under state statute, uh, we are striving to have 70% of people in Minnesota, age 25 to 44, have some type of post-secondary credential by 2025. And so I say all of that because if you didn't know this already, Minnesota has one of the largest disparities in educational attainment in the country. And so that's why we're talking about this, about why um, college is so important and the disparities that are in it. And so just really quickly, um, we have on, on our website, we have a breakup of educational attainment by race and ethnicity. And we have two data, we have two years um, of educational attainment data, 2015 and 2019. And so for those of you who are on the phone, I am going to do my very best to explain what I see. And so if we look at American Indian uh, in 2015, only 21.4% of the American Indian population had some type of degree or credentialing. And we did see an increase, which is great. So by 2019, the number bumped up to 28%. But if you compare that to all of Minnesota in 2019, that was compared to 50%, 57.5% of the population, and then 62.2% in 2019. So there's a huge gap, right? 62% versus 28. And then also I wanna point out um, that this, this can be disaggregated and it's, um, it's, it's important to understand the disaggregation of the data. So let's take a look at um, Asian, for example. So 62.7% of Asian people in Minnesota had a degree in 2015 and then 20, or excuse me, 64.2 in 2019. But if you disaggregate the data, which is in this panel right here, right, we're going to go down here and look. Um, for example, only 3.1% of Burmese people in Minnesota had a post-secondary credential of any kind. So um, I'm saying all of that because this is a very important issue and it's something that we're going to be addressing in our panel. And I want everyone to know who's on the call that this information is public. It's it's there for you to look at and inform and interrogate and ask us questions about. We're here and we want to open up the lines of communication about this educational attainment goal so we can all, as Minnesotans, reach it. And really quickly before we dive in, um, I do want to plug one other really interesting resource. Yep, I will absolutely, Eric, I'll absolutely put it in the chat. Um, I want to show, so this is called, oops, this is called the educational, sorry, the higher education educational profiles. So this is a fantastic tool for anyone, right? So whether you're in Cook, Cook County or Blue Earth County, we have tons of information about your specific county. So for the sake of today, since I'm calling in from Ramsey County, I'm going to click on it and it, um, it will pop out into another window and, sh and give you this PDF readout that you can upload onto your website. You can print it out if you're still in your schools and share it with administrators and your students. But it's got a lot, a lot of really useful and fascinating information about information that's pertinent to you as educators. 
So for example, it's got you know 21% of undergraduate students resided in the county. It's got ACT score, composite scores, graduation. And again, I'm going pretty swiftly just because I wanted to give a plug um, rather than go in depth with it. But it's got um, FAFSA completion rates and then if you continue to scroll down financial aid programs. And again, I will put all of this in the chat. <laughs> Um, and then something I find really interesting is based on county, what are the top five college destinations for that county? Or in other words, where do students who live in that county go to college? Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So I did just want to give those resources uh, and background information to sort of set the stage, like I said. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to open this up to the panelists now. And the first question that I have for all of you uh, is, is this. So Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC students are attaining degrees below our 70% attainment goal. What do we, post-secondary institutions and high schools, need to make, need to do in order to make, excuse me, make need to make in the college readiness arena better to prepare BIPOC students. Sorry about that. So what do we need to do in order to make it better for BIPOC students? I'll take a stab at this first, if I may, only because it's fresh on my mind. Uh, I had the opportunity, I just finished my, my doctorate this summer, and in my dissertation defense, I was defending, and I looked at Critical race theory and its application in college readiness, specifically AVID and dual enrollment programs. And I was looking for ways to increase access, particularly for BIPOC students uh, in higher education. And, and I was hoping to find, you know, a combination of interventions that would really lead to, to an easy answer, right? And I didn't find that, you know, in my data, not surprisingly. But my my uh, one-time advisor, Dr. Timothy Berry, is now at Metropolitan State University. He was probing me on, on what I found and the disappointment would have and, and he talked about the difference between program and culture. And the focus that I had myself and as we as a campus often have, and I think we as uh, professionals in higher ed have on programs and interventions versus the culture that we really need to create, particularly at a predominantly white institution in Southern Minnesota, um, to, to make people feel comfortable and to evolve our culture to be supportive of BIPOC students before we can talk about, um, you know, their outcomes and their success. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that too, uh, Brian, because I think, uh, especially here in Minnesota, that's one of the key things that um, we have to be aware of as educators. Is so thinking about ourselves first, uh, what, how are we making the environments for our students of color, our BIPOC students, uh, comfortable, making it welcoming. So um, if you work with students of color, um, they will be able to tell you which colleges and universities they feel more comfortable at, which colleges and universities are like, ooh, like when I do a tour there, here's how it feels. So I think that's one of the things that we have to do is make sure we hold our, uh, our uh, post-secondary institutions accountable to being welcoming to all of our students. Uh, so that begins with your tours, if your outreach. I've been with students on tours where I haven't even felt comfortable on the tour with the students as a person of color. So I think that's important for us. But then also as educators to be aware of our own biases so that we're not undermatching students, uh, being aware as I think about school counselors, educators throughout the state of Minnesota, um, being aware of barriers your school is putting in the way. So for instance, uh, which students are getting exposure to higher level classes so that they can take, uh, make themselves more marketable and presentable for um, post-secondary institutions. So who's not in those higher level classes? And so that's one of the things that um, research has showed. Students of color, BIPOC students who have 3.5 GPAs and above are less likely to get the right type of support uh, matching and finding post-secondary uh, institutions that match their skill sets and interests. So that's something that we can do as educators. So that's, that's just one piece. But then the other piece too, I think, um, is this has to be started at an earlier age, college and career readiness. Especially for us in Minneapolis, we don't have elementary counselors. And so if you're a school, especially when you're working with, with BIPOC students, 
they may not, and I'll speak for myself. I didn't have the generational parents that all went to the U of M or this is college or that. So it's important even more to create those exposure opportunities young where uh, students are able to see themselves on campus, see people who look like them on campus and know the variety of options they have instead of just what they see uh, in their community, that there's so much more. And I think that comes with exposure, knowing how early kids are able to understand career and post-secondary options. If I may, I can also add that at the high school level, one of the things that we do is that we help our students learn how the systems work. So for example, you know, when we work with our seniors, it's a really busy time of the year. They're navigating their classrooms, they're navigating their personal lives. Also, you're navigating scholarships, financial aid, college applications. So how does that all work together? You know, how do I apply to a college? What is the common app? So helping our students with that, I think as school counselors, we're able to provide that service. And if we have dedicated school counselors who are providing that resource, um, it helps our students be connected, know that there's a specific person that they can turn to, they have that relationship with them, they have that comfort level, they're able to ask them questions that they may not otherwise feel comfortable. So I think educating them about the process, sharing you know, tips about how these actual forms and other processes work, and just making sure our students get connected, for example, um, are there multicultural centers? Are there student organizations that are going to help them once they do get to the college or university, help them attain that degree? Because as we know, um, unfortunately, there is a high dropout rate after the first year. So we you know, get them there, but then what are we going to do to keep them there and help, help them be successful and earn that degree? So uh, if this is Patrick, and if I can just weigh in for a second, uh, and I agree with everything that's been said so far, I, I would add just a couple things. One is, interesting enough, I was having a conversation with a principal yesterday, um, a secondary school principal, and one of the things that she called out was just these sort of mindsets around the expectations for her students, right? And this is an IAB school, and the expectation, obviously, is that all of the students should be ideally benefiting from IB or advanced placement opportunities. But unfortunately, there's still sort of this undermining, if you will, or this broad sense of low expectation of students' abilities to perform in these classes, despite the idea that if they just get exposed, right, in some cases that makes a difference in terms of their ability to, to uh, feel like college can be a reality. I think the other piece for me, particularly looking at the secondary um, and primary space is when I look at that data, I, I often wonder where do the conversations in those spaces take place around that data, right? Do we systematize those discussions in ways that helps folks understand that we still have a bit of work to do in terms of improving outcomes for our young people? It's not just waiting until they get into higher education. It's really building the systems in secondary and primary uh, spaces to make sure we're putting more time on tasks that ultimately gets our students better prepared to to successfully transition from grade to grade and ultimately be in a really strong position to be able to matriculate to an institution that's going to meet their needs. So I, I think the data conversations have to be much more robust. We have to be very frank about what it looks like with our students from school to school. We've got to talk about where people are providing levels of supports that are needed for our students to be successful. We have to have a high set of expectations in terms of every student being exposed to rigor and pre-college programs, dual, dual enrollment, dual credit, those things we know reinforces their ability to be successful um, college students and ultimately um, achieve a degree of some sort. Yeah, and I'll just kind of uh, um, follow with what Patrick was saying um, in, in regards to expectations. We really need to start moving away. And when I say we, staff, administrators, legislators, and key actors in, in, in Minnesota, start moving away from the deficit mindset because that really is a subtle but impactful um, messaging that our students are receiving. Right? So we're looking profoundly on every single way we're communicating from tours, from visiting our interactions, um, looking at data, right? We're not looking at, well, these students are not doing good academically. They're not going to be a good fit. We're moving away from that. We're really looking at 
Well, are we providing enough access for these students? What is the system telling us right now? So systemizing that data, we need to look at it from that mindset and that frame of mind. And the other thing is too, is you know, what Brian was saying was trust, right? And trust and, and, and culture. Um, and, and that's that's important too as well, because when you're going on a tour, a lot of the tours are, well, this is the math building. This is where our students are going to nursing school. We know about the buildings and we can look outside. That's great. But to look at it from a micro, meso, and a and a, and a macro level, are BIPOC students being represented in tours? Who's giving the tour? When we go to these centers, do we students, do we see students who look like them? What about our administrators? Do they look like us? Do they care about us? Are we a part of the conversation? So that's also something to be considered too. That's that's subtle, but it's also profound. Our students see that. Um, so that's something that we also need to talk about. I, I think uh, to add, it's important for us to um, learn from our schools in Minnesota. Uh, well, first of all, look at our data. Uh, I think that's something that I'm really glad you brought up, um, Kat, is just each school, regardless of how big your school is, small, what part of the city or the state you're in, I think if you're really looking to support our BIPOC students in Minnesota, who the data shows are not getting the same level of post-secondary uh, applications and uh, attainment, um, you have to look at your school-specific data. Look at your school and your students that are BIPOC and um, how are you supporting them? How are you getting that messaging to their families? How do you bring in the community? Because you have to remember, uh, for a lot of our families of color, post-secondary is a family decision, not just an individual, where do I want to go? It's, hey, I probably have someone, that, and even speaking for myself, have people in my family I wanted to stay uh, closer home to, or they helped me with making the decision for where I went. So how are we engaging our families in these conversations? And then also, we do have some um, rock star uh, colleges in Minnesota that are really um, making improvements for how they support our students, uh, our BIPOC students. Um, but this is a shameless plug, I'll admit, for Augsburg University. Um, if you've been checking out Augsburg's demographics over the ten, past 10 years, Augsburg now has more students of color um, that are um, enrolling than they have um, white students. And Augsburg's done so many things intentionally to bring in, um, not just bring in the bodies of students of color, but the feel factor. And I know when I see students who uh, take tours of Augsburg and they have friends that are attending Augsburg, um, and ask any of your students of color, attending a post-secondary institution where there's people of different, uh, understand the racial background of your institution is huge for students of color. Students will say that. That's one of the factors for why they choose where they go is, uh, will I be the only one? How will I be accepted here? Will my identities be validated here? And so sometimes schools, um, students already know, they can list off to me the schools where they know they won't feel fully themselves. And it's not a knock against those schools, but I think they need to evaluate how inviting are you to students? Uh, all students, not just the student athletes, because a lot of schools have a great job of bringing in student, students of color, but it's usually the athletes. Then you celebrate them on campus as athletes and you put your resources towards your student athletes of color. But making sure you're seeing all your students, not just the ones who are doing something for your institution uh, athletically, uh, make sure you're supporting the students who barely got into your school because they need them. There's athletes who get support. Trust me, um, it's our students who are usually not seen um, um, for, for just wanting to do well at school or who are dying to feel connected. Those are students you really need to connect with and build community with them and help them feel connected because that's your retention piece. Look at your data of who's not being retained at post-secondary because all of that plays into a bigger conversation that our state is having, and that's our employment um, the disparities in our employment. And so uh, I hope that we as school educators see the role of not just getting students into post-secondary, but it'll help close the gaps that we have in employment, where uh, we have a lot of people of color in our in our state that don't 
uh, receive employment at the same level as our white peers in the state. So this work is really transformative for our state. Um, and the data is showing that we have a lot of work to do and it starts with us as school counselors too. I love hearing us all kind of talk about the, these outcomes and looking at our data. And I'm, I'm reaching the age in my career now, starting my 20th year in higher education to remember when in enrollment management and admissions, it was all about the number of butts and seats, right? And we were held accountable as institutions for butts and seats and, and witnessing the transition to the accountability now from the state, from politicians, from the public on success and not just getting in, right? And I think that's been a positive development. Now, the fact is we've all just discussed and we can probably all see there's huge disparities in who is successful and that's what we need to address. But I think just by witnessing and observing the, the attention shift and the accountability measure being placed on the data for who is successful, that puts more skin in the game for us in higher education just like it is at, at the K-12 level for getting students to graduate and getting students into college, for us to get students through college successfully and, and to that job, to that employment outcome. Um, so I think I think being aware of what our data says and, and being held accountable for those outcomes is, is gonna help us be better. And, and with that quickly too as well, and, and accountability, like focusing on the high school side, we really need to focus on the student to counselor ratio as well, because that is huge and that's a massive disparity. I think I was reading a bunch of reports, but NACAC came out with one a couple of years ago that Minnesota is 700 to one. I was reading one this morning, a report is 565. Uh, one counselor per 565 students. So we really need to look at that because not even if a counselor talk to one student each day, new student, they still couldn't get to all the students in that class. So we need to really focus on that because that counselor development, college and career readiness is important. That relationship and that mentorship, that's important. So we really need to look at that too as well. Yeah, and, and Derek, you might be able to speak to this more than I can from a, a Minneapolis school district uh, standpoint, but it's not, so when you, even when you look at those counselor student ratios, right, which are relatively high, it actually becomes even higher just by de facto of all the other duties that school counselors tend to have to have responsibility for, which even reduces the amount of time that they should be providing around sort of that pure college and career guidance, right? So that, you're absolutely right. Um, it is a real challenge. And I think schools do try to mitigate for that by maybe bringing in external resources, but we know that usually doesn't go far enough. So I, I absolutely agree that that has to be a priority issue in order to make sure young people, again, get the quality advising that they need across grade level. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share as well, because I, I like to just be transparent and real, because we're here in Minneapolis, and um, just understanding the impact of not having a school counselor at the elementary level, because I think when we're doing this career development, we have to understand uh, how kids develop in their understanding of careers. And a lot of that begins with exposure of people in their community or knowing what skill sets they have and what matches for future careers and what things don't match. And so in Minneapolis area, we, we don't have any elementary counselors. And that's who really leads that work. Mind you, also we're in an area that uh, is impacted with some of the most segregation in our state, some of the most uh, wealth gap disparities. So you have uh, kids who, and if they don't have a counselor until they're 12 years old, to help understand, hey, here's some potential careers that are available for you. Here's some things that you might not know are of interest to you. That's already putting our most vulnerable students, our BIPOC students, um, at a disadvantage. So I think uh, systemically, um, and I don't know who's all on this call, and I, I frankly don't care because I know we really need to invest in elementary education, elementary counseling, uh, because how will students know where they can be and build the confidence, especially for students of color who are like, man, like I need to see that positive messaging and even believe that these careers are attainable. I, I didn't meet my first school counselor that looked like like me or even know about the profession until I was 23. Um, and then I met my first school counselor of color that looked like me at 25. And so it shouldn't have taken me that long to really understand the role of professions that were available to me. And so I think we need to do that earlier. 
And I think uh, hopefully there's ways that we can put pressure on people who make decisions to um, whether it's MDE, OHE, um, that to get that into elementary school. Because I'll be honest, we need that in Minneapolis. And for a large district like ours, um, I applaud St. Paul for having elementary counselors to do this work so that their students don't get to middle school and hear about careers and resume and, and, and things like that for the first time. So that's one of the biggest barriers in the way. All right. Thank you, Derek. So I do want to address just a couple of things that have been in the chat really quick. So there was one person who said that this goal of the 70% attainment goal um, they're wondering if this is for the greater good of statistics or for the people that we target. Um, I just want to say from, from the state perspective, it is for the state's economic vitality. It's so that the people who live and work in Minnesota can have a family sustaining wage. And Derek was, I think it was Derek, who were saying that there are so many disparities within economics, right? People of color aren't getting these jobs um, based on the disparities that we have. Right. And so it isn't just for the good of statistics, it's for the good of the people of Minnesota that we have this educational attainment goal. And then another thing um, that someone said uh, is they, it was just more of a comment and I wanted the panel to hear it is that I don't think that there's enough emphasis on the benefits of people getting educated in their communities. Right. There isn't enough emphasis on why getting an education is important for their lives. So just a comment. Um, I want to move on to the next question, which is, I think, one that people are very interested in is what is the difference between applying to college pre-COVID and now? And how has recruiting impact been impacted by COVID-19, especially for BIPOC students? I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got to that one because I wanted to, to, to jump ahead to that in some of the earlier conversations. I Miguel and I think Derek were referencing campus tours, right? And, and how important it is for all students to visit a campus and get a feel for the culture of it, right? But particularly for BIPOC students, and particularly on a campus like ours, it's predominantly white. And so the, the challenge, the great challenge that we always deal with is that, and now compound that with, oh, wait, we really can't bring people to campus and the volumes and the depth that we normally do. And so... A lot of the conversations that we're having now, I was referencing at the beginning with Miguel in terms of some of what Mac is trying to do in the way of uh, replicating college fairs in a virtual environment. You know, how can we as institutions provide the same level of help in applying to college and help in applying for financial aid in virtual environments? And how can we ensure that, that we're, we're reaching students and families in as personal way as necessary? Um, that's going to be a great challenge this fall, and um, I'm excited to see some of the opportunities coming up, but I also recognize the significant challenge that's going to be. Yeah, and go ahead, Samina. Okay, thank you. One of the challenges that I will share is that pre-COVID, we were, you know, we were in the schools. I'm a high school counselor. I'm, you know, hanging on the hallway. You build those relationships with the students. You see the students every day. You can write a pass for them. They can come see you. You go see them. You see them after school. You see them at the com community events. You see them at the sporting events. So, you, you know, just I, I think visible and being a resource, you connect with a lot of families and a lot of students. So I think Post-COVID, we have to make extra efforts to build that community. And we're doing that at Johnson, for example, by having regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with our students. We're using technology such as Google Meet. Um, you know, we're doing our leadership program. We're still trying to do all that. But I think another thing to keep in mind is as we do these efforts to um, connect with our students, do they have the appropriate technology? You know, do does everyone have their own device and that connection? And also, what kind of responsibilities are they having to take on besides just their schoolwork? So I think we have to be um, thinking about all of those factors and how those are affecting our students. You know, what else is going on in the student's life besides just school and how can we best support them? Yeah, I, I also, I mean, I think I'm glad that our colleagues, uh, my colleagues on here, that I want to also share out to every educator, every school counselor that's on this call or any role where you're supporting students, the biggest game changer for this year is that ACT being waived. 
that is a game changer for our students of color. I've watched and begged and harassed post-secondary institutions to allow students of color into their programs who struggled with the ACT. And so uh, now that that's magically waived, um, um, I think it's so important that we share with our students of color that no longer is that a barrier. And I don't think we realize how big of a barrier that that was a barrier holding solid student BIPOC students away from getting into post-secondary. So many times I see students of color that had high GPAs but struggled with the ACT. And we know the ACT is a bias exam. All the research is there. If you haven't looked it up and you're in this profession, please go look that up. Um, so now, uh, if you're working with students, uh, BIPOC students, share with them. First of all, the ACT is not going to be a barrier. Encourage them to match. Find schools where they have a GPA uh, that, um, and also helping students to be mindful of when they're doing their applications. Uh, how can they, and we'll talk about later, highlight uh, what they bring to campus uh, and their res the way they bring in skills and resilience as they're applying. But also, what I've also uh, learn from students during, because I have some students that I, when I worked at a previous school that I talked to and stay in touch with, and the seniors that I'm connecting with is um, the differences they're sharing about in this pre, in this COVID period is students are now starting to consider uh, opting out for cheaper post-secondary options. Uh, the two-year schools, I would imagine, are seeing a boom. A lot of the students that I worked with previously are saying that they're choosing to stay at home instead of on campus, especially because their schools are going uh, virtual. So that's another consideration that is different during this period. Uh, and so I think it's important that we have relationships with students where we get to know them and help them make a decision that's best for them. And we have to understand that they're making a career decision in a time of uncertainty. So they're going to be nervous and anxious. I saw that with our seniors at the end of last year thinking, should I even go to the school anymore? This had always been my dream school, but I don't know. It's Is it worth driving or flying there and to have to be online? And so I think one of the biggest things we can do is be school counselors, hear the feelings of our students, especially our students of color, because it's already nerve wracking going to post-secondary uh, new environment, especially in Minnesota, where it's mostly predominantly white schools. But now you have to wonder about, goodness, how do I make those connections in a virtual setting? How can I feel a part of the school in a virtual setting? So have those considerations in mind for your students as they're applying during COVID. Thank you, Derek. Um, and to add as well, you know, one of the things that our, our students are going to have to face is access to information, right? As opposed to, you know what, a U of M rep is going to be in our high school next week. Here's a time slot to schedule an appointment. You can get all your um, questions answered. Some of our BIPOC folks don't even have access to internet. And now that we've shifted, that's a challenge for us too as well. How can we how can we meet students where they're at? So that's something that we're struggling with as well. Accountability. Again, coming to the high schools, finishing um, applications, ensuring that the uh, financial aid, uh, the FAFSA application gets started and finished, right? Information about events. But other things too as well that gets overlooked is parents, right? We need to focus information and, and, and getting parents up to speed as well because of the shift that's happening. Grades. Uh, in the high school level, right? Going to no grade, pass and fail. That's also changing the application review process. Um, letters of recommendation, that relationship opportunity to build in the classroom, outside the classroom, extracurriculars, that also is a concern as well because of COVID. So that's a difference as well. Um, interviews, if students want to come to campus and take an interview, there's another thing that has changed, right? Um, there's a lot of things that has really upended the admissions and the application process um, because of COVID as well. I want to piggyback a little bit too on the ACT conversation, and I, I want to maybe uh, join the fight that many of you are probably already in as, as folks on the K-12 side. Uh, but I think the ACT being magically waived for a lot of us institutions down this year is a good thing. But I need to challenge my higher ed colleagues as much to say it's not just about the admission decision in the ACT consideration. But when you look at scholarships and course placement into college level English and math, which we know are really critical to students' retention and completion ultimately, is 
not having to take remedial level courses in college. If we're still using standardized test scores in those scholarship and course placement decisions, that's going to have a similar effect in terms of disadvantaging, particularly BIPOC students. And so as we as higher ed institutions are grappling with what to do with the disruption of ACT and what we know about the test and its flaws, we need to deal more comprehensively with it. And I hope that my colleagues and I will continue to kind of have those hard conversations beyond just who can get in uh, the admission process. Yeah, and to follow up with Brian, another challenge would also be, though we are going test optional for maybe one or two years, how about extending it more for another two years? Because fresh first year students in high school are being impacted by it as well. So we, we need to look strategically but also in the future as well. Maybe it could be five years, six years, who knows? Um, and that's something that we need to make a decision earlier than later. Yeah, and so I, I do want to comment on a couple of those things from some of the chat responses from our attendees. So is there a concrete answer from the institutional higher education perspective about ACT and it affecting merit aid? Is that going to be, how is it, how is it dealt with at a higher end level? You know, from my perspective, it's still an institutional decision, right? And I think it can often be two things. It can be an afterthought sometimes because we're drinking water from a fire hose trying to deal with this pandemic and reacting to test optional when we know it's the right, th right thing, but it can often be an afterthought. And then in other cases, um, one of the first things we did on our campus was, <clears throat> all right, so all of our scholarships, if, if any of those are privately funded, what do the gift agreements say? So if you have a, a gift agreement that was developed with a donor that specifically articulates a test score, you can't just automatically repurpose that money, right? And so it requires a lot more depth of conversation. Uh, but, but I think to, to your basic question, Kat, it's, it's going to be an institution by institution conversation. And I think the more of us that can continue to bring that conversation up to each of our institutions, the better odds we'll have it making advancements. Great, thank you. Was someone else gonna jump in? I heard somebody on mute. Yeah, so I, I just wanna add a, a, a thought to this ACT, SAT conversation. And so while I applaud schools moving away from these tests being um, sort of requirements as part of the admissions process, I will say, even those students who are higher performing students, particularly um, students of color, right? They still struggled for for a, a variety of reasons academically, right? And, and, and it's not even just academically. I think it's also just some of the concerns related to microaggressions and just the culture of these institutions are that that is not palatable to meeting their individual needs. And so while I think um, we can get sort of fixed on the idea of removing tests, I think there are broader challenges, right? We need to make sure we're addressing to ensure that attainment becomes a reality. Um, uh, obviously, some of this has to do with how we're thinking about serving our students in the secondary institutions academically, but certainly once they reach the college space, um, there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of expanding, I think, the appropriate kinds of student, um, uh, sort of the student supportive services, making sure we're pushing it harder on the needs around some of the developmental concerns that our students might have. You know, we know in many cases they're still struggling with basic writing skills and time management, and those things that, again, we know are critical to be successful, right? And although they come out of our high schools with high GPAs, unfortunately, in some cases, they still lack some of those critical skills that's gonna you know, allow them to be successful. So I think that should not be overlooked. The other thing I wanna just mention too is um, I'm, I'm real, real concerned, right, about uh, for those young people who are always, um, in, in sort of a precarious situation in terms of whether, you know, um, college should be an option. We've, we've been able to, in some ways, to convince them that yes, it is. Um, I'm also worried about particularly, you know, those young people who see college as a way to get out of some circumstances that might be very challenging in their communities, right? What, we, what do we do for them? So part of me feels like we need to be thoughtful about, you know, uh, creating profiles or at least identifying those students who might be at risk of turning the corner in a different direction, particularly in a direction we don't want to have happen, right? Um, and make sure we're, we're still being aggressively, um, or at least doing aggressive outreach to those students to keep them sort of focused.
As we talk about ACT, another perspective I would like to add is the access to the ACT. Um, at our school, a lot of the a lot of the juniors took the ACT back in February, and that was the first time many of them had ever taken it. They many of them did not do a pre ACT. They you know they did not have access to that personal tutoring or any other services that would have prepared them. And we have, you know, majority students of color at our school, and we know about the biases with the ACT to begin with. So the concern is, you know, what is the access? They were not able to take the ACT again in April and then in the summer. So if we, you know, if they're trying to sign up for the ACT in October, it's just not available in St. Paul. It's just not available in the in inner cities. It's not available in the urban areas. One of my families with means they were able to sign up for the September test out in Minnetonka. So what does that really tell us about access for our students? You know, some schools are offering the October test um, within their district. So how are we serving all of our students and their needs to have access to that resource just like anybody else? That's you bring up something really interesting to me. I'm I'm surprised, although I should be right, and it's always been a pet peeve of mine how much pressure students are under around those high stakes tests, right? And even despite all the disruption, despite the rush from many of us in higher ed to move away from at least temporarily ACT scores, the immense pressure I get from members of our community here on taking that test and getting to that community next door for that coveted spot, um, and I think. I, to me, that's problematic. Whether whether or not, I mean, there there are places for for exams. And, and to Patrick's point, how do we assess students' capabilities and and assess um, formatively what they need to to be successful at the next level? And yet, we're putting so much emphasis on that one variable, and that's the wrong place to put our emphasis. And, and I think, unfortunately, COVID is is not giving us as much of an excuse to get away from that as I would have liked to see so far. I have, I have one question uh, for Brian and Miguel both that was in the chat, which is if the ACT and SAT are taken out of the college admissions process, will more um, weight or emphasis be put on academic rigor in, in the process, in the admissions process? That's what one of the panelists or attendees asked. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start. Um, no, I think it's a holistic approach, right? So when we're looking at applications, um, we're going to find come through everything, academic rigor, um, the academic context factors, but also contextual factors too as well. How are they impacted during COVID? There's going to be multiple points in the application. If that is, uh, if they've been impacted, they can share that with us. Um, from anything, right? Um, we're looking at any leadership opportunities. So if, if to answer the question, no, it's not going to put a higher emphasis because of SAT or ACT. I, I would certainly uh, support Miguel. And, and, you know, in our situation, we're not a highly selective institution. We have pretty standard benchmarks based on students' ability to be successful in our data. And so we aren't drilling down much further if a student meets that GPA benchmark. Within our appeals process, we do more holistic. But one thing that I think is really interesting, Min State has been going through the implementation of multiple measures and course placement. And so they're working with a research organization, uh, MSDR, I believe. Give me the acronym, I'm going to screw it up. But in summer 2019, we had one of the researchers from there to kind of introduce this concept to us as campuses as we began to implement the usage of high school GPA and multiple measures and course placement. And the, the um, the randomized control studies that were done looked at cumulative high school GPA. And many of us are familiar. In fact, my own staff and faculty, we all had the same biases sitting around the table. Well, this cumulative GPA at this school means something different than the cumulative GPA at the school just one suburb out, right? Or this, this core, this, my student took all AP classes and their cumulative GPA is different from the student that didn't take any, any AP. But these randomized controlled studies looked at cumulative high school GPA and found that they were a better predictor in student success in college. The, the data showed us that. Now, certainly the GPA plus the test score were even better, right? Like the more information that you have, the better. But it was very clear that it, it to me, and I've used that with our faculty back on our campus to dispel that myth that I think oftentimes comes about. It, it, 
Um, it is important on a granular level to look at, at pieces and where students are struggling, but I think it, it's not wrong for us to use cumulative GPA as evidence of a student's ability to perform over the course of four years. It's not wrong for us to look at that pretty strongly, and we need to do more of that. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to move us swiftly along to the next question. So thank you, Brian and Miguel. So the next question that we have deals with college access programs. So what experiences do students gain in participating in college readiness programs like Get Ready, AVID, TRIO, College Possible, and Ramp Up to Readiness? I'll, I'll share from um, the high school uh, perspective, just the school perspective of uh, just first of all saying thank you so much to uh, the different college access network programs, because that is, uh, there's so much success that we see from our partnerships with them. And so um, one of the best experiences students can gain from being a part of those groups is the support, the because we all know, um, and when I uh, was in a school building, um, it was nice knowing that we had colleagues that were a part of College Possible or Upward Bound uh, or schools that are utilizing the ramp up to readiness curriculum so that students are able to understand some of the things coming up. You'll see by junior year, a lot of them start to understand safe match and reach colleges, understanding um, what's the components for applications, understand um, visits, understand deadlines. A lot of times, uh, if you don't have that generational support, if your family didn't go, if you're first gen, uh, college access network programs support you with some of those things, but also it puts you in an environment with other students, and it's usually students that are BIPOC who are trying to figure it out together and getting that guidance. So it builds an amazing community of students who are really able to push each other and hold each other accountable. And that's huge, especially if they're in a higher level class by themselves or no one other person in a higher level class. Uh, it's usually someone who might be in uh, one of the programs like College Possible or TRIO. The other key important thing with uh, the college access partners is that they provide uh, a soft handoff to post-secondary institutions. And I think when you start to understand our BIPOC students, that relationship with the next institution, uh, where you're going, that in schools that do the summer bridge programs or whatnot, those are so crucial. And so being in a part of a college access network kind of helps you with that transition where I know some colleges have TRIO or they have college possible advisors. So there's so many benefits. And I think what we can do as educators is identify all of our BIPOC students that are eligible for those programs and make sure we support them in um, registering, be, getting connected, because uh, I think that is a game changer, especially for students who are on the fringe, who uh, I had students who were lower GPAs, but for them, just getting that support with knowing how to do applications and prepare for post-secondary uh, really boosted their confidence in who they were, and they had a better senior year because that motivation factor. They're like, okay, I have something to work forward to towards next year, and I have a direction where I'm going. I have people helping me, so it's essential that we get our BIPOC students connected to those college access partners. So, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So the so what I'll add is this, and, and these programs, they've made a huge difference in terms of the growth of college enrollment, particularly for students of color for, for a number of years. I mean, if you even go back to the 60s when some of these programs started to develop, started to develop like Trio and Upward Bound, for example, and more recently programs like Gear Up, which, is, which started probably more around the late 80s, they have been huge in terms of growing um, college enrollment rates, again, for, you know, low-income, first-generation students of color. And so they make a huge difference. And then, of course, we've seen the growth of these additional college access programs, again, that add value to schools' efforts to be able to improve post-secondary outcomes. Um, programs like Get Ready, for example, which is which is a gear-up program, um, uh, has huge benefits, right? And one of the unique aspects of the program is that we're able to start, to Derek's point earlier, we're able to start as early as middle school in terms of getting our students um, to start thinking about, um, you know, their 
college and career aspirations, right? And so we literally can build a strong support system around those young people um, and follow their progress over the course of their um, elementary and high school career, ultimately getting them ready before, you know, they graduate for, so, for some sort of post-secondary opportunity. You can do things like one-to-one -one advising with a level of consistency. You can get them exposed to co-curricular activities. You can get students um, far more exposed to, you know, college and career um, fairs and, and, you know, doing things like job shadow, um, you know, uh, opportunities. There's a, the, the, the opportunity for getting students prepared is endless almost with programs like this. I think the challenge, of course, becomes um, making sure that as many students as possible benefit from this kind of opportunity, right? And I think often what happens is you end up with this sort of duplication or overlapping of services that unfortunately ends up leaving a lot of our young people out. Um, part of that is really just making sure that these programs um, organize in a way where they can drive more of an integrated student support system, meaning that all students at some point or another are benefiting um, from, from some of the the activities that these programs have to offer. Um, I think this is also where you push in on these data conversations a lot more, right? And often I would say in the second, secondary space or even in the elementary schools, these are discussions that often should often be led by school administrators, right? Which is to bring all of the relevant people in space, whether it's a principal or AP, school counselors, certainly on the post-secondary partners and talk about the data you showed um, earlier, CAT, or data that's specific to those individual schools where you're getting pushing in on conversations around who's being served and not, or, or who's being served and who's not being served, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, these programs, they're, they're huge. Uh, I think the only challenge for us is to make sure we're thinking very intentional about who's, who's being served and, again, to make sure that um, young people aren't being missed. I would also say that they can also be a huge benefit in terms of how we think about improving effective practices around post-secondary and school buildings, right? Um, ideally, if we do these programs well, we should be sharing, um, you know, strategies that ultimately, you know, school practitioners can adapt um, or take, take over as these programs transition out. They don't have the sort of longevity that we'd like them to have. So ultimately, we should be leaving some practices that schools can benefit from in the long term. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know how, you know, we would be successful without many of these programs. It's a huge benefit. Um, I just think it's a question of how do we better coordinate and to make sure we're identifying all of the students that should be served. I'll just add to that also, um, in terms of the AVID program, we find it very beneficial, not only for our students who are considered to be the bubble students. These are not typically the 4.0 students who are, you know, on their path to a four-year college necessarily at the beginning, but the AVID classes offer a lot of support. They, you know, get to visit colleges and they get to learn about, you know, what's a resume, how do you ask for recommendation letters, just figuring out all those different steps, what's financial aid. But also what's really beneficial is that it has a school-wide impact. So a lot of the AVID strategies can be used throughout the school and other classrooms as well. For example, the note-taking skills that you're going to learn in AVID, you can use that in your science class. You can use that when you're writing that paper in English. Um, keeping that binder for AVID, for example. You know, are you staying organized? Do you know when to turn assignments in? You know, so that way you're not missing out on points and getting a lower grade, for example, just because you forgot that a test was coming in or you need to turn something in by a certain date. So I think a lot of the strategies, for example, that Abbott offers can be used throughout the building. And also as a former student, I participated in Upward Bound years ago. So um, I personally know the benefit that our college access programs can have for our students because I was a participant. So as a first generation student, a woman of color, and also you know, being Pell eligible, I was able to get a lot of resources. They helped me understand how to do the FAFSA. No one understand, no one understood really how that language worked and what was being asked for. So being able to understand that, being able to go to the college campuses and just have someone that you can rely upon.
However, having said all that, I do want to point out that, for example, at our building, we have 1,400 students all together. And the number of students who are participating in the college access program is no more than, I would say, 200. So what are we doing to meet the needs of the other 1,200 students? Because every student, in my opinion, should be getting that level of service. So that's where the need for school counselors comes in, having a comprehensive counseling program so we can meet all of our students' needs. Thank you, Samina. Miguel, are you going to jump in? Yeah, just really quickly. Okay. And I was just going to make a call out to all our educators and our counselors on the phone. Um, please advise your students to mention that if they're involved in those programs um, on their applications, because that's an asset for us. Um, we can see that students thrive when they come into higher education if they're involved in that program at the high school level. And secondly, shameless plug for our institution, we have a professional in the admissions department who strictly works with our CPOs, our TRIOs, College Possible, to create specialized program um, for those, uh, or for programs alike, right? Um, and then I'll put my shirt, put my information, but if you want to contact me at movies at umn.edu, um, we'd love to have you and partner. Thanks, Miguel. So again, um, if it's all right with all of the panelists, I will put your contact information. So Miguel's contact is is movies. Like I want to go see a movie. Uh, movies at umn.edu. Right, really easy to remember. Thanks. Uh, and so to the panelists, I, I just wanted to share a comment that was that was shared in the chat before I move on to one of the next questions. So uh, someone commented, "I'm a school counselor at a very rural, rural school." and our dominant population is a migrant student population. We have ramp up programs and career classes. However, so many of these students who need this are the ones that tend to leave around November to move back to Texas. More programs need to be able to reach rural communities outside of the greater metro area. So just, just wanted to make sure that that comment was heard uh, by our panelists. Um, and now we're going to move on to the next question, which, um, I think is, is such a fascinating one in terms of admissions. So most colleges are using holistic admissions to look at the college as a whole person, not just at their test scores and GPA, which is something we talked about. But the question that, that we're concerned uh, about is how are students' involvement with the fight for racial justice looked upon in the, in the admissions process? So if they're, if they're participating in the protests fundraising and or some type of advocacy work. How how are they able to demonstrate that? And how are universities going to be looking at this? Well, uh, I'll start off and, and again our admission process isn't highly selective. And so it's it's not it's not unless a student's applying for scholarships generally or in an appeals process where they're trying to demonstrate um, you know, ability to be successful that, that we're often looking more holistically. But I, I think this is going to evolve. This is relatively new in terms of the most recent um, activism taking place kind of post the last, last year's admission cycle. And so as we head into this fall, I think what we are typically looking for to indicate students' ability to be successful are things like persistence, uh, commitment, uh, leadership roles, um, genuine interest, right? And so just like I would tell an average student, if it doesn't matter what club you're a part of, but if you're bouncing around every club just to say you've been in them, that's going to be transparent and it's not going to look favorably on you. So similar, similarly, if students have pictures of themselves at protests to feed their Instagram feed, but it's clear that they haven't been terribly involved or done much depth beyond that, that's not going to benefit them. But if a student is engaged in student organizations, um, is, is raising money for specific causes and has kind of and can write about that experience and what it means to them and why they're doing that. Um, from my perspective and everything that we're looking at, that's going to that's going to benefit them um, uh, in those ways. But but I think it's important to say this is going to evolve for us. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, Derek. Uh, as I uh, and as I see uh, our youth. Uh, start to share about the work that they're doing, especially here in Minnesota. I mean, we have to be mindful that our, and here in Minneapolis, we're very mindful of it, but our state uh, was on global news 
And so I think it's important that, uh, first of all, as educators, we play a role in supporting students in doing this work. So at some point as an educator on this call, wherever you live in Minnesota, you have to ask yourself, how are you supporting students and validating them in wanting to do this work? Because if you're an educator who didn't even bring up in school or in a lesson or in your school environment about the racial injustice that's gone on, you're already a step behind because our kids are thinking about it all the time. It's a part of who they are. Their identity is navigating some of these conversations and speaking up because they feel drawn to this because of their identity. So I think as educators, how are we creating spaces to help students demonstrate peacefully? When I was at Champlain Park High School, we had students that demonstrated uh, in school. And I think we have to be honest, uh, where do you stand on that? I support our students when they're um, speaking out against uh, racial injustice. So um, we need to start creating those opportunities for our students. So I know one of our school counselors at the middle school wants us to do some type of way to memorialize and, and demonstrate as a district of students uh, about George Floyd because George Floyd happened within minutes of uh, some of our Minneapolis schools. So that's one way we can bring instance and say, hey, here's how you can highlight the ways you're working in the community, not just with pictures and posting them so you look good, but what does this mean to you? How are you reflecting? But then I think it's important because your post-secondary institutions have to be honest about why this matters to you. If you're bringing in students, especially students that are, have experienced racial trauma in our city, um, when they share these stories, how are you as a post-secondary institution ready to hear these stories and deal with our students who have experienced trauma? Just because they're sharing these stories of what they do, it can't be a one-off to get into college. But those issues don't go away once they're accepted, and especially if they're going to school in the metro area. It's a huge piece of their life and, and their experience. So how can you support them with doing that same proactive work? at your school? How can you all create opportunities there? So our goal is to help students find those opportunities in high school and highlight it on their applications and show you all their leadership skills, especially as people, uh, as BIPOC people. But then how are you showing the students uh, that you value that kind of effort that they're putting in? Because if they get to your institution and you're not showing them that, then why do you even ask them that on the question? Why do you want them to be holistic if you're not going to accept the wholeness of who they are and the traumas they're experiencing outside their front door, not just watching it on CNN? Thank you, Derek. And, you know, one of the things that we as an admissions office at the U of M um, really just tackling it on. So, for example, creating a space that you mentioned, Derek, we're doing that. The admissions office is hosting an event for a VIP leadership conference, right? And on October 17th, we are strictly catering an event for our BIPOC community to tackle this very issue. So, for example, that conference is going to be centered around identity and how to leverage your leadership skills because a lot of these students are speaking out who are on the streets, who are fundraising, they're leaders in their own right. So we want to bring those students onto campus. We want to be them around their peers across the state of Minnesota and to see, okay, this is my identity. This is how I can leverage it. And this is how I can really dismantle these inequities that have been facing us for the longest of times, for years, right? So we're tackling head on. Um, so that's one way. And then in the application process, Again, ample opportunity to, to mention that. And if you attend VIP, that's something that we also highly favor as well. It, it's a leadership conference for, for our students. Miguel, would you mind putting that in the chat? A absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll share my email address and, and share some information. Okay. And then um, can I just get a visual cue, thumbs up from the panelists? Is it okay if I share your email with the attendees? Okay, great. So I have um, I have one one last question. I'm going to skip the question about the future of college just for the sake of time. So we do have some time for our participant uh, additional participant questions. But the last question, very very quickly, uh, if you can, uh, is. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a gap year for Black, Indigenous, and people of color students? And what resources are available for BIPOC students in considering this decision? 
So, um, so gap year programs can offer a huge benefit, particularly to, you know, low income, first generation, you know, black and brown students. The, the, the problem is there's not enough of them. Um, and the ones that tend to exist, again, unfortunately, often end up being targeted to probably the highest performing students. At least that's been my experience when we know that these programs can benefit a range of young people. Um, you know, despite their sort of academic um, background. So I think we need to be more thoughtful about who gets access access to these programs. I think the other challenge too is just making sure that these programs offer um, uh, adequate resources. And I know my experience again has been that, you know, students would get accepted, but unfortunately they're put in sort of the tough position of having to figure out how to supplement costs, which we know is almost impossible for a lot of our young people. Um, you know, city year and year up, Programs our public allies do a really nice job of supporting, um, you know, their students. I've had recent experience with a program called Global Citizens Year, which actually sends young people, or, you know, to places across right the world, um, which ends up being huge experiences, um, or I should be valuable experiences for young people. The only issue again is just making sure these programs offer the funding that's going to ultimately support their access. I think for our students, we have to look at them case by case. So I think understanding the whole student and what they're going to be working on during that gap year will be highly beneficial for us as we, you know, advise them one way or another. So as we know, during the pandemic, many of our students have had challenges with their mental health. So will a gap, so some of our students did choose to take a gap year so they could focus on that, that they could heal and then they could continue with their higher education when it was going to be best for them on mental health wise as well. But on other students, for example, you know, is it possible for you to continue with that program that you set in place from pre-K all the way now so you don't lose that momentum? You know, you already have these supports in place, you're getting assistance with filling out the FAFSA and other financial aid resources, maybe you have a scholarship of some sort. You know, I would say for each student, you know, what are the pros and cons? By taking a gap year, are you going to possibly forget some of those skills or forget, you know, or will it be more of a challenge once you do decide to go back to have that same rigor and be able to fulfill those expectations when life happens um, during that gap year? So I think it has to be a case by case decision, um, looking at what the needs of the students are. I'd really reinforce what Samina said. I think. Gap year became a real trendy topic in news media around higher education, right, in light of COVID. And I think, uh, Patrick, to your point, there's some excellent ways that students can be intentional and, and a gap year could benefit students, and particularly BIPOC students. But I think it's important to remember that BIPOC students are often some of the most at risk for college readiness and retention anyway. And as Samina just pointed out, if a student is looking at a gap year just just because, you know, or isn't very intentional about it, I think um, that the data will tell us the further away that students get from, from their education, the harder it is to come back. And particularly if a student is has been uh, playing catch up with, with readiness in the way of math, for example, taking that year off without intentionality could probably be more detrimental. Um, and so that, that individualized determination and really what's the intentionality behind a gap year? You know, if, if it's a the students in their family situation isn't able to afford higher education at this point. That's incredibly legitimate, and, and there are great ways to, to go about that. But the intentionality around how they're saving money, how they're keeping themselves prepared academically for what they're going to experience is going to be really important. I think it's important, too. Um, I, and I put a link in the – and thank you for sharing that, Brian, because I – I am glad you said it depends on that student and their case by case. And um, I think looking right now at the being aware of the pulse of current high school students and understanding for them, um, the data shows there's been an increase in even consideration for taking a gap year. Or uh, if you read the article I shared in there, it talks about how many students are, did consider, are taking a gap year this year. And I think it's important for us to be mindful historically when students talk about taking a gap year, what it means. So for some of our more affluent students, 
that gap year means they're traveling the they're traveling they're hooked up with an agency they're traveling they're going to different countries and one of the key focuses is that they want to have a more cultural rich experience uh, that's one of the main reasons people do uh, uh, that gap year and study abroad so I think for our students who are looking for that, guess what? You can get that right here in the Twin Cities. And so if that's one of the main reasons people are looking to, uh, to do a gap year is to grow in more of your life experiences, why not, of all places in the, in the country right now, consider where, how can you do that in your own community? How can you do that in the Minneapolis area? There's so many opportunities to engage with people right here that are struggling and hurting or a different background. You don't need to go to another country uh, to get to learn a multicultural experience. So I think it's really important we share that with our students that how about you begin that process here? And then I also feel when I've worked with uh, BIPOC students who have shared they wanted to take a gap year, it's so important that you create a plan for students. That is not just uh, because the other thing is that I, that I worry about is summer melt. And so especially uh, as we're navigating uh, the pandemic, students who do perform well in school, sometimes just lose their confidence and their excitement to go into post-secondary because a lot of things they were looking forward to, they're not sure if they'll have anymore. So I think it's important if um, they're taking that gap year, they're having a plan for uh, continuing that momentum. How are you working? How are you doing career development to make sure you're knowing what field to go into? How can you be ready to ensure you've done inventories to know what are the best ma potential major area or fields you want to go into? Because the other thing is this gap year can be used as a time to really, uh, the data shows that so many students change their majors when they get to college. So this could be a really intentional planning time. And especially, again, bringing it back for BIPOC students and families, building that relationship with the families to say, hey, all right, family, here's how we're going to evaluate your gap year. Um, and make sure that midway through that gap year, uh, you build in time for uh uh, circling back to what's your post-secondary plan. It doesn't have to be um, just college. It might be what types of maybe potential trades you're interested in or, or technical programs. But I think a huge piece of taking a gap year that I've seen work with students is at some point mapping out what's your plan for enrollment, maybe even halfway through uh, the year, or what's your plan for the following year so that there's a deadline with that gap year, because we all know it can easily turn into gap years, and then people never go back. And that's what we want to reduce is students who are initially interested, excited, especially during this time where we're in um, a pandemic, we want to make sure we hold that interest. And so that uh, students can apply and still go to post-secondary, especially our, our BIPOC students. Thank you, Derek. Yes, that's so important that people have a plan. And I do want to I do want to address a, a question uh, in in the chat. So um, someone said, "I'm interested in ways adults who are entering or returning to higher education, possibly for retraining or after having been laid off during the pandemic, should be considering what they should be considering in applying to college." So. They're, I guess they're just wondering what what can we what can we say and what can we talk about for the non traditional even though the traditional aged college student these days is twenty four or twenty five right it's not that fresh out of high school so what can we say to these these um, population like adult learners what can we say to them so uh, let let me just add that sometimes it's a little challenging for adult students, right? Depending on where they are. But, you know, I would, my experience is usually around um, encouraging a conversation that maybe has, has adults look at a city college as an initial point of conversation, right? Because that's a fairly entry, a fairly entry, easy entry back into, you know, colleges and adult students, right? So the, the only challenge sometimes might be related to um, access to financial resources, but I would probably start there. There's also, there tends to be, and I don't know the Minneapolis landscape that well, um, but there's usually 
uh, social service agencies or community-based organizations that focus on these sort of reentry um, uh, supports, particularly for adults. So they typically will have a direct relationship, whether it's with a job training for program, for example, or certainly with you know two-year um, colleges who might have a, you know adult education classes as a, as an initial pathway to start. So I would suggest starting there. Um, the, the other thing too is, that, and I know this gets a little bit, you know, tricky for parents, but um, in some cases, maybe reaching at, back out to the high school could be also another option for, you know, t in terms of talking with counselors about what could be a potential, um, who can be potential contacts, particularly at those colleges that, again, can abridge sort of the, you know, the planning process for adult learners to go back into the, um, into the college setting. I would simply add in terms of in some ways it's it's there's similar advice as to what you'd provide a, a first generation um, new student whose family has no experience navigating those systems right I mean the reality is our higher ed systems can be uh, archaic and, and not super user friendly and so that can be intimidating I think for for somebody who's been in the workforce and so starting with um, as you're accessing some of these resources Patrick talked about, really trying to focus on self-reflection on what is my goal? Have I been told, you know, is, is, is it to get this next job, I need this credential? Is it, I was in this industry and that industry is no longer viable and I want to be in this industry? But really getting your, your head around what it is you want to accomplish can drive, do I need a two-year degree? Do I need a four-year degree? Or do I need some other type of credential? Uh, because once you once you start pursuing those credentials, right, it's going to come down to how do credits I have in the past transfer? How long is it going to take me to get that? And then what's it going to cost? And so having a really firm grasp on what your end goal is um, will make it easier, I think, to navigate some of those conversations. Another question that we had in, in the chat directs to is, is related to the first question that I asked about, um, you know, what, what, what can institutions do to support IPAC students and what do we need to do? And so one of the comments was she was asking us to clarify not just what we need to do, but to explain uh, what we are doing. So if, if people on the panel could, could answer the question, um, what institutions are actually doing to help mitigate these disparities? And this is the, this is the last question that we have time for. Um, I will I will send these questions out to the panelists, and also we'll maybe even use them to help inform our next public engagement calls. But uh, in that, what are institutions currently doing uh, to help mitigate these disparities? Uh, I can go ahead and start. Um... I'm really fortunate and the universe is really fortunate that they're dedicated a lot of resources and money towards this. Um, specifically, you know, I lead a team who meets these students and these communities where they're at. For example, our indigenous community, right? Um, we have our counselor, Chanel Flower, who meets with tribal uh, sovereign nations and is meeting with key partners across the state to meet them where they're at, right? That's what we're doing currently um, as far as reaching out and providing access. But another thing too, as well as for families, right? Providing just standard literature. Uh, one of the things that we'll be rolling out here relatively short is material in their uh, in their in their native tongue, right? In Somali and Spanish and in Mali, right? Basic information about deadlines, because again, with our BIPOC folks, it's 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 not just a single decision. It's a family decision because mom or dad may have to pick up a second job or a third job or work on the weekends. Um, so we want to bring everybody uh, to the to the table to make that decision. So those are some resources that we're providing as well. And we're also very fortunate that we 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 publicize that we have uh, native speakers in the office in the admissions office who speak different languages. We market that as well. So we're providing a lot of resources and a lot of different touch points uh, for students and families. In terms of the high school and what we're providing, at, I feel fortunate to be at Johnson High School because we have a dedicated counselor in the College and Career Center where we are able to make those connections and meet with all of our students to help them with their higher education journey, whether that be a four-year college, two-year college, technical school, certificate program, 
you know, we help them with that journey and we provide that guidance to them as they go forward. Also something unique at Johnson High School is that we have the Johnson Govies program, which is a leadership program that any student can join. There's no criteria for GPA as there is in a traditional student council. So these students are actually mentors and leadership um, provide leadership for our incoming students. They run the advisories, they do community service projects, and they really enrich the experience of all of our students, including our students of color. Specifically for our students, like in terms of college career readiness, you know, we're providing financial aid nights. You know, over half of our student seniors will get their FAFSA or Minnesota Dream Act done at that financial aid night. So obviously we can't gather hundreds of students in the auditorium this year and then have them break off into the computer labs to complete their FAFSA or Minnesota Dream Act, but we are going to do a virtual program to provide that service as well. Um, providing translators, we provide translators for Hmong, Somali, um, Spanish languages, and any other languages that our students are speaking not only to understand like, you know, um, the different handouts and the forms, but to form that relationship with our family. So they know, hey, you know, we have someone that we can contact and who can help us get connected to the resources that we need as well. College application workshops. And part of this is through the Minnesota Higher Education, uh, Minnesota Goes to College Initiative, known as College Knowledge Month. So we participate in that as well, college application workshops, um, scholarship night, making, you know, making our students aware of the opportunities that are out there and also connecting with our higher education partners. We invite our college representatives to meet with our students. That was easier done um, before COVID in person. They would visit our college career centers. We would help connect them. Um, but we're going to do that virtually this year as well. So I think, you know, our school is doing a lot uh, to help our students have that connection and have that support as they navigate higher education. I made two quick examples, you know, from our campus, this co one COVID specific, right? So we knew uh, we have some early move-in programs and other community building opportunities for students of color based around certain ethnic and racial identities and weren't able to do that in person this year. And so uh, diversity and inclusion was really intentional about creating some specific Zoom groups and, and outreach kind of requiring students of color to get connected with other new incoming students of color to, to build some community that way. Um, combined with, for our retention efforts, a lot of a lot more outreach to students while they're enrolled, both last spring and now this fall, multiple times throughout the semester to ask them proactively what they're in need of. Um, and then two, um, we, we're part, I'm partnering with our concurrent enrollment folks in our College of Education in a pilot, we got a grant from uh, the Department of Education around uh, concurrent enrollment and looking for ways to expand access, and particularly to expand access to students in educational programs to recruit more teachers of color. And so we, we looked for ways to expand the admission requirements based on data, didn't find a, a ton of good examples nationally, and so are instead focusing on a program of support in the concurrent enrollment class and in the concurrent enrollment experience that we could allow students that don't meet the admission requirements into the concurrent enrollment program, support them in this way, and then measure their outcomes. And if they're able to be successful, can we use that as means to expand um, who gets to participate in dual enrollment, which we know can benefit our BIPOC students. Absolutely. So thank you. Oh, Patrick, did you have one last thing that you wanted to say? Well, quickly? No, okay. I was just going to quickly say, you know, get, get ready, of course. Our role, right, is to help get our young people ready for these opportunities, right? So we've got a cohort of young people, 8th, ninth, and 10th graders that we're providing intentional supports to, right, to ultimately get them prepared for a successful transition. So we're, you, we're uniquely positioned, right, to, to push in with, I think, some sp special supports that, that ultimately gets them prepared. Yes, of course. Um, and I will put the Get Ready website in the chat. So I want to say really, really quickly, we had 141 people stay with us. At, at our most, we had 214 people. So thank you all, each and every one of you, for coming and staying and spending an hour, hour and a half with us um, on this really important topic. So thank you again. Uh, I want to do a quick Quick reminder that there will be a recording sent out with, um, with the links that were referenced in this webinar. 
Um, our next webinar is going to be September 30th at 10 o'clock. So that's a Wednesday, September 30th at 10 o'clock. The topic is going to be FAFSA and DREAM Act updates because October 1st is when the next FAFSA is, is going to be open. Um, when you exit this, you will hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, be uh, experiencing a pop-up that has, or get a pop-up that has a survey in it. Please fill it out. We want to know how we can improve, how we can make this better, how we can really cater to the needs of the community. So with that, thank you. Have a wonderful Wednesday. And again, I wish I could have a really big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care.